Alright guys, this video is about ATP and how it is the energy currency of the cell. So that is why I have an ATP molecule and some money signs up here. So I'm going to briefly explain what ATP is, why it's important, and how it is actually used and recycled in organisms, especially human beings. All right. So first, let's start off with a little bit of background about ATP. Um, it is used by all life, all life that we know of. Of course, we only know of the life that exists here on Earth, but all life uh, uses ATP as an energy currency, and I'll explain what that means here in a second. And also, it is very, very old. So the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, as we see here, that's what that actually stands for, last universal common ancestor of all life, which existed from uh, three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, actually used ATP to fund reactions in, um, in those cells. So let's talk a little bit more about the history. Uh, LUCA existed, as we said, um, 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago. Um, we can see here that uh, animals exist right here. We, of course, are animals. We are mammals. Uh, we can trace back all lineages, whether you're a fungi, a plant, animals like us, archaea, bacteria, all the way back to this last universal common ancestor. And we know that all this life up here actually uses ATP. And, of course, uh, the ancestor that gave rise to all of this here also used ATP as well. So it's a very important molecule because it exists in all life and um, it's very, very old. All right, so the ATP structure itself, let's briefly go over that. So um, ATP actually stands for adenosine and triphosphate. So our adenosine part of our ATP is actually made up of two things. We have an adenine, which is right here in the blue, and then we also have a ribose sugar, which is here in the pink. So those two things hooked together um, make up the adenosine. And then we have triphosphate. So we actually have three phosphate groups that are hooked together, of course, with chemical bonds here at the end. And um, there are two ways of looking at this. We have the cartoon version up here. And then we also have a molecular model version down here. So we can see the actual elements that are in our ATP. We have, of course, nitrogen. We have carbon at each of these areas here. We have hydrogen. We have oxygen. And, of course, we have our phosphorus as well. So as you can see, these are actually flipped. So you can match up the colors. We can match the turquoise here with the turquoise here. We can match the, red, uh, the pink, excuse me, for the ribose here and then the pink here. And then we can also match the three phosphate groups, yellow, which of course are all of these guys right here. All right, so we should be familiar with looking at ATP in both of these ways. All right, so let's talk about a few more things that um, are interesting about ATP. So as we said before, we have the ATP, the adenosine here, this is what well, that's made of the ad adenine, excuse me, and the ribose. And the adenine here actually corresponds to the same adenine that is in DNA here. So we can see that the adenine that makes up one of the bases of DNA, all the yellows right here, actually correspond to the same adenine that is here in ATP. So we can see that parts of ATP, which are very important, and also, of course, DNA that's very important, uh, certain molecules are used uh, over and over again throughout life. And also, this ribose sugar, as we remember, um, if we see an ose at the end of a molecule name, we can uh, know that that is actually a sugar. So the ribose is a sugar, it's five-sided, uh, much like how sucrose is also a sugar as well. So you have ATP, it acts like money. You can uh, fork over however many ATP it takes to think, to listen to music, to grow, to reproduce if you're an animal. 
and then plants need to also fork over however much ATP to make uh, sugar that they're going to actually use to make even more ATP. And then to grow and to reproduce, plants also need ATP to do that. Now, just like you would need to have a job to buy the shoes, you would actually need to consume food if you were an animal to make the ATP, the currency. And if you were a plant, you would need to go through photosynthesis to get the food to make the currency. So if you want these shoes, you need to have a job to get the money to buy them. If you want to think, you got to have the food to get to the money, the ATP, to, to do to think. If you are a plant, you want to grow and reproduce, then you need to carry out photosynthesis to get the food, to get the money, which is the ATP. All right. So I mentioned this before. So ATP is very cool. It has some really cool facts associated with it. So an average muscle cell, an active muscle cell, actually needs 2 million ATP molecules per second to function. That is a lot of cellular cash, as we, we could say. So that much energy is actually pretty expensive, right? 2 million ATP molecules seems like it's very expensive to operate that active muscle cell. Another cool fact about ATP, if you were to run a marathon, you would actually turn over, you would recycle 75 kilograms of ATP in a single marathon. Of course, the average human being weighs around that, but how in the world does that happen? We're going to talk about that. So, and just so you can have a clear idea of how much 75 kilograms is, that would be the equivalent of around 70 pineapples. Each pineapple is around almost two and a half pounds. All right, so how do we use so much ATP? Us humans, actually, we only have 100 grams total of ATP, 100 grams. It's actually not that much, right? That's almost like 100 paper clips. So how do we get to use so much ATP if we only have total 100 grams at any one time? Well, of course, we have to recycle. So, um, ATP actually can't be stored for very long. We have to recycle that molecule over and over again. And I'm going to talk to you about how that happens. So we actually are going to talk about two forms of the energy currency molecule. ATP, which actually um, gets its name from a triphosphate, right? Adenosine triphosphate. And we're going to also talk about ADP. And it gets its name from the adenosine, the same adenosine that's here, but it only has two phosphates, so therefore that's why we call it di. All right, so how does this happen? How do we get energy from ATP, and how do we also recycle it? We're going to talk about that real quick. All right, we actually call ATP a fully charged battery. The reason why we do that is because there is a lot of energy in these three bonds here. We are actually going to only use the energy that's in this last bond, but there is high energy phosphate bond right here. And that's why I put the little energy thing right there to show you that there is energy between these bonds. Now, there is energy between any chemical bond. There is energy here, there is energy here. But we actually only use the energy that's located right here when we actually remove the bonds. So, because this is full of energy that the cell can use because of this uh, bond right here. We say that this is actually a fully charged battery. This whole thing is filled up. So when the cell needs to use energy to fund a reaction, then it needs this ATP, three phosphates, and it needs to use the energy that's in this last one here. All right, so how do we release the energy? We actually need to break the bond, and then that releases our energy here. So when we break the bond, then the energy is released in this phosphate. And when we release the energy, we actually can do work with the energy that's released. So we've, we've broken the bond here. We've released energy. That energy can go on to do work, whether we need to lift something, whether we need to um, run a marathon, whether we need to breathe, whether we need to think, whatever it is. That energy can go on to do that, and we're also, of course, going to be left with an additional 
phosphate here because it has now left the, the uh, ATP, which is why we have ADP, because there are two phosphates here. Now, as far as the battery goes, we say that the battery is only half charged. It's not fully charged because we've lost the energy, right? The energy's gone and done and done work. It's not, there isn't energy right here in this bond anymore. Of course, there's still energy all around the molecule in bonds, but we only use the energy that's, that's located in this last bond. So because it's ADP, we're not going to use that to fund reactions in the body. So that's why it's half charged. So we need to get it back to its fully charged state, which is ATP. So how do we do that? It actually is gonna look very similar to what we see here, but we're gonna kinda go in reverse. So we have ADP, we know it's half charged, and what we need to do is we need to basically replace what we lost. So we actually need to add energy. It actually takes energy to put this phosphate back on, but it actually takes a lot less energy to put the phosphate back on the ADP than it does uh, when we actually release it, the energy from the ATP. So when we release the energy that was right here, that was actually a lot more than what we see down here, the required energy to add the phosphate back on to ADP. So if we uh, use energy, which we can actually use energy that we get from our food, right? So the, the picture back when, when I said that animals need to eat food to get energy to make ATP, well, that's where this energy comes from. And it actually comes from um, cellular respiration. So we can just shorthand it, respiration. That's where it comes from. And we're actually going to learn about that later. So cellular respiration. And... The energy that we get from breaking down food, we can use that to add a phosphate back on the ADP so we can get our fully charged battery. So once we do that, once we add the energy and we have a free phosphate around that we add on there, then we know that the battery is fully charged again, as we see here, because we have that energy back into that bond that we can use, of course, to fund more reactions, more work. All right. So let's briefly go over some awful equations about how this happens. Now, I didn't talk about how water is actually part of this reaction. Um, it, we actually need water to break off the phosphate. It's a little bit more detail than what we need to go over right now, though. So if we add ATP and water, we actually can break off that, that phosphate there. We can break off one of those phosphates to where we get ADP. And then we get a free phosphate, like we saw before, those ye little yellow circles. And then we actually are going to also get our energy to do work, like walk and think and talk and all that. And uh, if we want to reform the ATP, well, we basically just reverse this. We need to start with ADP, of course. We need a free phosphate, just like the one that we lost up here. And then, of course, we need energy from cellular respiration, from breaking down that food that we love to consume, right? And then we're going to get our ATP back, which then can be used to do more work. And we're also going to release some water, because remember we had to actually add water up here. We're going to release that back out when we do, um, when we form our ATP. And actually, that's the water vapor that you're breathing out right now is actually from the formation of that ATP. So thank you, respiration, for allowing us to breathe out water right now. So that is my introduction to what ATP is why it's important, where it comes from, and how we recycle it so much. Thank you.